A lot of SF authors think that this tiny technology will not only work wonders, it'll also have hidden repercussions. In Michael Skeet's short story, Relics, Dr. Nelson Singh faces a new medical condition created by nanotechnology. It's called nanophobia. How much research did you do on nanotech before writing Relics? Well, I've been doing a little bit of reading uh, on what's currently being done or, or posited in terms of nanotechnology. There is a wonderful book, and I can't tell you the author's name, but the title is something like Great Mambo Chicken and the Transhuman Condition, uh, about uh, research on the far edge of science, you know, verging into pseudoscience. And one of the fields that they talk about is nanotechnology. They think that it's physically possible now to, to do things like etch tiny little electric motors uh, onto um, almost molecular-sized pieces of silicon. So. Uh, um, I think the research there was just a matter of extrapolating will to, to where technology currently exists. Aren't a lot of SF authors getting a little carried away with nanotech and saying that it'll do stuff that it'll never be capable of doing? Oh yeah, I think that there's no question of that. It becomes a, a simple plot device. It's the ultimate deus ex machina in, in, in that sense. But at the same time, I sympathize because in a lot of cases, the technology in science fiction is allegorical or metaphorical anyway. Uh, you're simply using it as a vehicle to make a point about the way things are now. So you can be forgiven a certain amount. If you go back to the golden age science fiction stories, a lot of the stuff that they were um, imputing to technological develop developments turned out to be impossible. But it doesn't reduce the effectiveness of the stories. What obstacles do researchers have to overcome before we'll see the first nanotech machines? If you start creating little tiny devices, they, their movement is going to generate heat, which generates excitement, and it's going to be difficult to keep any little tiny molecular structure together with that much heat and activity around it. So the thermal problem is one of the big factors. Um, the other is how do you end up powering these little tiny devices. Our bodies do nanotechnology now, but our, our metabolic processes are very, very slow compared to, uh, you know, the electronics and, and optical technologies that we have these days. So we'll probably end up uh, within the next 30 or 40 years with some very limited amount of nanotechnology in the biomedical field where you can, um, you know, put something into someone's body that will act uh, like a super antibiotic, these sorts of things should be possible. Uh, but to um, really get to the level of a Star Trek replicator is, is at this point, uh, it, it's a dream. It's just like faster than light travel. We don't know how it would ever happen. Dave told me that nanotechnology was the only way that the food replicators on Star Trek could produce hot meals as fast as Picard can say, make it soul with a side order of fries. I mean, that's how my nano-cybernetic computer cook Nancy keeps me going. The first writer to explore nanotechnology, although he didn't call it that, was Greg Baer. His novelette Blood Music won the 1983 Nebula Award four years before Engines of Creation was even published. In Greg's story, smart cells called neocytes escape the laboratory, and in the longer novel version, they eventually infect the entire population of Earth. Nancy, open a line to Seattle, please. Since Blood Music, Greg has continued to extrapolate a future reshaped by micro-machines in his novels Queen of Angels and Moving Mars. Ah, uh, Greg, it's Commander Rick. I was wondering where you first encountered the idea of nanotechnology. It must have been uh, about 1985 when people pointed out to me that a novel I wrote called Blood Music uh, was kind of the mythic equivalent of nanotechnology, which was being promoted uh, by Eric Drexler in his book, The Engines of Creation, uh, about the same time. And uh, Drexler had been working seriously on the idea for years, and I had published a short story version of Blood Music and then written the novel during the, uh, roughly the same period of time. Drexler was before me a little bit. I thought it was fascinating. I didn't use the word nanotechnology in Blood Music because it really didn't it hadn't come into my consciousness at that point. Uh, after that, it was just a very powerful idea, and not too many people were working with it when I started writing about it. So I made it a major uh, theme of, uh, of uh, Queen of Angels. 
I've heard writers complain that some authors treat nanotech like mini magic, but aren't you guilty of that too in Queen of Angels when nanotech turns a metal tray, a plastic clock, and a boot rack into a gun in a few seconds? Perhaps, but I'm writing stories. I'm not, I'm not here to, uh, uh, to moralize about the kind of stuff that I do. I do have moral guidelines that, that I will not break in my fiction. I will not tell a deliberate lie. On the other hand, I think the potential for these technologies are so extreme that what I'm describing very likely will be conservative. Hmm. Getting back to blood music, do you worry that we're experimenting in the area of nanotechnology with as little understanding of the consequences as your character, Virgil Ulam, had? No, no. Uh, in blood music, the idea is, um, is pretty extreme. It's a mythic idea. If I take and apply that to the current politics of... Uh, of science, uh, it's perhaps as dangerous as nuclear technology, but uh, in the long run, um, I think it would be much more beneficial. It gives uh, uh, people a kind of power which frightens us to some extent, but on the other hand, we're coming out of uh, the adolescence of humanity. It's time to assume the power. We have to learn to be responsible with it. There's no way to avoid it. We cannot go backwards. We can't unlearn something. The desire to do that, I think, is, is uh, pretty atavistic. At one point in the novel, a researcher who's battling the plague of smart cells wishes to himself that Mary Shelley had never written her book. Would the medical profession be better off without Frankenstein? I don't think so, no. Frankenstein's entertainment. Uh, the, the, the journalistic use of the word Frankenstein, of course they always refer to the monster as Frankenstein, that's incorrect. Uh, they always apply it to the most innocuous things. You know, if you're going to put strawberries out on a field that have been uh, genetically recombined to be resistant to certain funguses or whatever, well, is that in fact creating a Frankensteinian monster? Well, Frankenstein's strawberry is something that might end up on, on Nickelodeon five years from now as a, as, a, as a cartoon show for kids. No, it's ridiculous. Uh, the Frankenstein's monster is the cliche of man is, or woman is playing with things they were not meant to know, okay? In fact, that just doesn't work anymore. We have to know everything. The less we know, the more dangerous we are. The more ignorant we are, uh, the less uh, we can handle our own problems, the less responsible we are. Uh, that's the problem. There are things we were built to know. Nature made us to know these things. We must know them. That is our job. Ignorance is dangerous. Right. Thanks, Greg. Darn, I thought ignorance was bliss. Well, maybe bliss is dangerous. Nanotechnology is still science fiction, but scientists can now cut and paste together amoebas the same way Dr. Frankenstein stitched together his monster. In 1990, Swiss scientists at IBM manipulated 35 atoms of xenon to spell IBM. And you thought advertising had fine print now. And in 1993, American scientists developed a working steam engine that was less than a tenth of a millimeter across. As for letting nanotech cure my sore back, I don't know, call it nanophobia, but my computer Nancy has arranged an appointment with a real life-size physician who can eliminate all my health problems. Hello, Dr. Kevorkian, is it? Yeah, I have this problem with my back. It's very sore, and Nancy said you could eliminate the pain and I would never feel anything again. Great, what do I do? It's well known that the Japanese abacus can perform calculations as fast as a computer. But next week on Second Nature, we'll look at the world's first abacus-generated animation, a short cartoon entitled Steamboat Watanabe.